Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. Hi guys, welcome to another session of the database seminar series at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. We're excited today to have our friends at Snowflake to come give three talks in one session, which it, is never, it has never been done before. Let's see how it works. Um, our first speaker will be Nalima, uh, who is a tech lead of the Data Lakes team at Snowflake. Prior to that, she also worked at, uh, at Microsoft. We have Tyler Jones, who's a software engineer at uh, Snowflake, who will be talking to us about, who's also a tech lead, uh, who talked about streaming ingestion at Snowflake. And finally, we have the great Ashish Matavala, who is the founding engineer and the the number one uh, the number one programmer in all Snowflake, right? It's not the French guys. It's not Marcin. It's a sheesh. The entire company is based on his, his geniusness. So we're very excited for him to spend uh, the afternoon with us talking about databases. So with that, Nalima, go for it. It's always actually for the audience. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself and fire away at any time. So we want this to be a conversation and not just have uh, our Snowflake friends Snowflake friends talking themselves for an hour. Okay. All right, the floor is yours. Go for it. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Andy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and as, an, as Andy said, we are here to talk about three new features in Snowflake. We have uh, three topics, three very interesting topics to talk about. Icebook tables, streaming in just and many stores. So uh, let's dive right in. So the first thing uh, we are going to talk about is Iceberg. And uh, Snowflake announced support, native support for Iceberg tables in the Snowflake Summit uh, this year. Um, it was a pretty big deal. And we are going to talk about what it means, why it is important, and all the design changes that we had to make to achieve the support, to achieve snow, uh, Iceberg support, support in Snowflake. We will cover a short history. We will skim through the history of data lakes and the problems in traditional data lakes. Uh, we'll talk about how Apache Iceberg solves some of those problems. Um, what we did in the Snowflake architecture, what we changed in the Snowflake architecture to add support for iceberg tables. And once iceberg tables are created through Snowflake, what does one need to do to access them using external tools? And what are the new challenges that we are going to address in this space? So let's start with a short history of data lakes. Anybody uh, who is familiar with, this might be very familiar to people who have used uh, data warehousing using Hadoop or Hive or any of the older systems. Um, uh, on, the, what, on the right, you can see that we have a storage layer, which is typically HDFS um, in the past. As cloud services became more popular, we, have, we now have S3 Azure blob storage and so on. On the storage layer, typically you would find Parquet and ORC files or files in any other columnar storage that, uh, but Parquet and ORC are the most popular ones. And then we have a compute layer. This is the layer which um, munches all of these data files and produces, uh, processes those and produces results, right? There are SQL interfaces, there are other programming interfaces um, and many other different programming interfaces that people have come up with. As a result, on the compute layer, you can see lots and lots of blocks, boxes. Hive, Spark, Big, Fino, Flink. And uh, there are so many more, I just couldn't fit anything in there. But one, uh, there's one basic thing that underlies all of these systems, that all of these systems were built on top of files. Traditionally, uh, data lakes used files as their, use the file system as their metadata layer. Tables were organized, all the files for a table were organized in a directory. And any file that showed up in a directory automatically became a part of that table. When, uh, partition, when, when there was a need to partition the data, we said we will create a nested directory structure and all the partitioning partition files then showed up in the nested directories. But um, the ownership of the files into a table was very implicit and it was based on which directory the file landed in. And once the file landed there, it was a part of that table. Uh, this was improved a lot by the query engines and they tried to introduce some transactionality and some consistency guarantees uh, to all of these systems. But the underlying um, storage assumptions continued to stay the same. This, as you might expect, this started causing lots of problems. There, were, it was, it is not easy to provide asset guarantees. You can see, like, even though there was a files, 
metadata layer in the file embedded in the file system, there was also a meta store which which held your catalog information, which said, these are all the tables I have, and these are all the partitions in the table, and this is where the data for them sits, like the root directory, right? Uh, so when an update operation or an insert operation happened, you would need to put the file in the particular location and also update the meta store. And there was no great way to do this in an atomic manner. And uh, there were tools that didn't always go through the meta store. They sometimes went and accessed files directly. So obviously they didn't see get a consistent view of the of the table. Sometimes they saw uh, files that were like not properly committed to the table. And this resulted in like basic transactionality problems, right? Multi-partition inserts were not atomic. Isolation, as we described, was, was best effort. The query engine tried to do the best it could, but if somebody goes and accesses your storage independently, all bets are off. Uh, schema evolution, extremely error prone. Partition evolution almost always needed a complete data rewrite. And there was no good way to do access control. Maintenance was difficult, like, um, or cleaning up orphan files, uh, cleaning up expired tables, deleted files, uh, identifying which files are referenced in which table. All of this was um, pretty, there were no, there was no like standard tools for doing all of this. And most companies that use these systems ended up creating their own custom tools and building processes around this and would have an entire team trying to maintain and keep the storage effective and efficient. Uh, so it was, it was it was difficult is uh, the best way to describe it. Like overall managing all of this was extremely difficult, but people liked it. People liked that there was no vendor lock-in. They could use their own storage and had more control over the data. There was a single source of truth. They didn't have to maintain multiple copies of the data for different use cases. And most importantly, they liked using all the different tools that came, um, came up, that showed up uh, in the open source world. Like Trino, Flink, Spark on the same data set. But um, the absence of a way to provide all of these transactionality guarantees was a deal breaker for us. Like, there's no way Snowflake can function as uh, without providing isolation guarantees or without providing asset transactions. So uh, this is where Apache Iceberg came into the picture. Apache, I, in, with Apache Iceberg, uh, it, it was uh, born at Netflix and they introduced this as a table format. Uh, just as a file format describes how to store data in a file, a table format describes how to store data in a SQL table. It, it uh, specifies how to perform updates on the table so that all readers have a consistent view of the data. It describes a spec to achieve snapshot isolation it, and it provides a way to say that to explicitly define the membership of files in a table. Uh, schema evolution is easier. There is better better way to do partition evolution. And there is an explicit metadata layer that you can update and modify and version so that you can time travel more effectively across your data and metadata. So uh, let's, dive, let's take a deeper look into how Iceberg achieves this. So in the earlier diagram, we just saw one flat storage layer where all the data files, which was mostly parquet and org resided. And then there was a compute layer that, that went and munched all of those files. Here we see um, a tiered system. We see a data layer, a metadata layer, and a catalog. The data layer continues to be the same. Here we still have the parquet and the org files, but we have a very explicitly uh, called out metadata layer. Here we have a metadata file, a manifest list, and a manifest file. And together they maintain a snapshot of the table. And as DML operations happen on the table, newer, saps, newer snapshots of the table appear and you get snapshot isolation when you're accessing iceberg tables as iceberg tables through the iceberg catalog. And a catalog is simply a key value store saying that, hey, for table so-and-so, this is the root metadata file and go and this is, through this root metadata file, you can spin up the entire table. You, get, you can get all the necessary information for that table. Um, you can find more details about uh, Iceberg from the spec here. But for now, I want to move into um, how this applies to Snowflake and what were the changes that Snowflake made to adapt to Iceberg. So this is a very popular uh, diagram of the Snowflake architecture. We have the data storage layer, we have virtual warehouses as compute warehouses, and then we have a cloud services layer. Uh, 
this was published in the Snowflake white paper. There's a link um, link in this presentation. But um, all the layers are properly defined and separated out. So in this in this uh, in the Snowflake architecture, these are the sections that need to change to adapt for Iceberg were the metadata storage and the data storage. In Snowflake, data storage happens in FDN files, which is um, which is a columnar file format that Snowflake came up with, and it is highly optimized for storing columnar data. Uh, in the open source land, an equivalent would be Parquet files, which is the most popular columnar file format. And the metadata storage for Snowflake has been um, EP files and and has been stored in EP files and and in FDB, EP files are expression property files where we store um, statistics about each file, like min max statistics, NDVs, number of nulls, default values, and so on. Um, and then we have all of that indexed properly in uh, in FDB. And together with FDB and EP files, we have a really really powerful metadata system. Uh, but Iceberg has a completely uh, different way of storing metadata. It is all stored as files, and it is all stored uh, in storage as files. There are no, there is no database requirement for storing all of the metadata. So there was a challenge for how do we translate, how do we draw a mapping from the Snowflake metadata to Iceberg metadata? For data storage, it was fairly straightforward. Like instead of writing like Snowflake proprietary files, we will now write Parquet files. But then there was also a challenge about like, how does the metadata map? Uh, oh, before we go to the metadata mapping, uh, there's also a new concept. So all of these, uh, the metadata storage and data storage, this needs to happen on a, on the customer's volume, right? In the customer's bucket. And uh, the way to achieve, in order to achieve uh, writing to a customer's bucket, we needed to introduce a new concept called external volumes, uh, which which would be a storage location. It's, it's simply a storage location that the customer gives us and it says, hey, this is the location I want you to write my Icebook data files and the metadata files. And these are all the access um, credentials for accessing the data. And um, we support all cloud providers, all the cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and GCP, just by nature of being multi-cloud, customers can pick where they want their data to be written. Uh, once a volume is created, and when you create an iceberg table, you associate the volume with the table. When you insert into the iceberg table, data shows up on the volume. There's nothing too complicated about it. It's uh, fairly straightforward, but it is really, really important because it provides customers to say, this is where I want you to write my data. And customers now have complete access and complete control of their data and the metadata files. They can use external tools to read, uh, read the data, to process it, and do what you what they want with it, right? Like there is no, the the data doesn't seem to be locked into Snowflake. They don't have to export it out. Um, next, we are going to talk about uh, what happens for a Snowflake. What happens when we try to do run a query in Snowflake? Let's only consider the right side, the Snowflake part of this diagram for uh, for the first part. We will go bottom up. Let's say there is a there are several insert operations that happen on a table in a transaction, uh, and all of these insert operations write some data files. Once these data files are written, uh, Snowflake will capture the min, max, and statistics for each of these data files and write them into our EP files, which is the Snowflake metadata artifact. These EP files are then referenced in the Snowflake uh, meta metadata layer, which is the FDB, and uh, once um, once all of these EP files are uh, written in the FDB, we create a new version for the table, which is then associated with uh, those EP files, and this table version is committed. Once the table version is committed, new uh, queries can see all the updates that have happened to the table. Now, uh, how does this work for iceberg tables? We have we try to create a mapping for each of the concepts that we have in Snowflake in to have an open source concept. So when we write data files, instead of writing FDN files, we, we now write Parquet files. When we write EP files, instead of write, uh, in addition to writing EP files, we also write the iceberg metadata files, which are the manifest files, where we write, where we list all the Parquet files and their statistics. These manifest files are then written into a manifest list, and we create a new snapshot, where when in Snowflake, we would create a new table version, in Iceberg, we create a new snapshot. And then the snapshot gets committed 
all external tools will see the same updates that Snowflake sees. So there is no lag. Everything happens in the same transaction and external tools can access everything in the exact same way that Snowflake accesses those files. Uh, finally, when we were actually trying to generate this metadata, we noticed that um, generating the equivalent iceberg metadata requires us to write at least three files, that is three different foot operations on S3, which uh, gets really expensive for low latency queries. Like you don't want a small one row insert to be um, doing three foot operations and it, in, it increases the query latency actually quite significantly. So uh, we had to make a choice of generating the iceberg metadata in line in the Snowflake query or generating it in the background. And uh, because of the high latency for like writing these three additional files, we decided to generate it in the background. And um, in addition to uh, having background metadata generation, we also have a path that, that generates this metadata on demand. So if the background thing has not yet caught up and, and some there was a request from the Snowflake catalog to, to access a specific table, we will generate the metadata on fly and return it. So external tools still continue to see the all the latest updates on the table. How does this tie into external tools? Now you have an iceberg table, you have all the iceberg metadata. How would how would one go about accessing it? Let's say you have a Spark, uh, you have a Spark shop that needs to access this iceberg table. Iceberg provides a fairly a very convenient SDK that is used by almost all the tools uh, that use that support iceberg tables. So Spark would load this iceberg SDK and it would say, uh, from the Snowflake catalog, I want to read the orders table. Uh, once the iceberg SDK gets its name, it looks up in the catalog, what is the, root lo what is the location of the root metadata file for the orders table? It pulls out, that, uh, pulls out the root metadata file, spins up the table metadata in memory and sends that back to Spark. The Spark, Spark can now query that table. Um, when Spark is querying the table, it is querying the exact same data files that Snowflake created and Snowflake queries. So there are no two copies of the data and uh, Spark sees all the updates that are happening to the table as the updates are happening. So there's no latency or there's no lag in uh, the updates seen by external tools. So this is all well and good um, because Snowflake provides really high transactionality guarantees, right? We, uh, we of course, we are asset, we have asset transactions, we have isolation, and we have multi-statement, multi-table transactions. And when you're running uh, iceberg tables through Snowflake, you get all of that. But in addition to that, you get all the other features that Snowflake Snowflake supports. You get ingestion for iceberg, uh, continuous data ingestion for iceberg tables. You get clustering, materialized views, search indexes, row-based access control data masking and, and everything else that Snowflake supports. So uh, using iceberg tables in Snowflake makes it a really, really powerful, makes them really, really powerful, right? Like now you have data in your bucket. You can use you can use your Spark jobs. You don't need to rewrite them. You can use your Trino clusters, Trino queries. You don't need to change any of that, but you can, you can use everything in Snowflake as is. Um, uh, Yash has a question. Yash, you wanna go for it? Uh, yeah, um, I have a question about the Mac background metadata file generation. It's like you had two slides ago. How do you get persistency for that? So let's say you have data inserted to database, but the metadata files were not generated. Mm -hmm. um, if a server were to crash, how are you supposed to find the files with no metadata files uh, generated for? So if the server were to, uh, as, as you see in this picture, like if yeah. Spark wanted to query, um, query a table, then it would ask, the iceberg SDK to load the root metadata file from a catalog. So here the catalog would be a Snowflake catalog and the, the request would come to Snowflake. If the server crashes, there would be a different server to which that request would come. It would say for the orders table, give me the root location of the, the location of the metadata file. Uh, because the metadata is not generated, it would generate the metadata on fly because we already have the Snowflake metadata. All we need to do is translate the Snowflake metadata to the iceberg metadata. So uh, the the operation does not commit unless we commit the Snowflake metadata. The translation oh, yeah, at any time. That makes sense. You have like two cop two versions of the same metadata, and you're able yes. to translate from one to the other. Cool. Thank you. Um, 
upcoming challenges. So uh, we uh, we want to we want to do a lot more for uh, iceberg tables. Data lakes are traditionally left unencrypted. We want to increase security for all of these tables. We want to make sure they are all encrypted. And the big piece for encryption is um, is enabling having a having a better way to do key management. I think that is the biggest challenge for uh, high scale data, like all of these data lake systems. We want to provide a way to migrate existing tables to Snowflake without rewriting any of the data files. So this would simply be a metadata trans metadata transformation translation to Snowflake. Um, Iceberg has introduced row level deletes. So uh, they have position deletes and equality deletes, and we want to be able to support all of those, all the new features in Iceberg in Snowflake. And finally, we want to contribute Snowflake features back to the Iceberg community. Uh, there, are, there are lots of new things, new and interesting things that we've done in Snowflake that customers love and uh, that we are not able to um, make available for Iceberg tables because simply because the format doesn't support it. And we want to give back by saying that, hey, you know, um, we embrace this and uh, we want to, we want everybody to be able to use all the features we have on Snowflake. A question from Chris. Yes. Hi, I was just wondering, um, can you have transactions that span these metadata routes? Like, can you get snapshot isolation across multiple routes? Uh, when you do it on, when you do it through Snowflake, yes, because uh, Snowflake, the when you when it's an iceberg table, it's Snowflake. It still goes through Snowflake's transaction system, which which does allow uh, multi-table transactions and multi-statement transactions. And uh, the metadata translation, as I said, happens in the background. Once the table, once the Snowflake metadata gets committed, all of that translation happens in the background. So. Um, Iceberg metadata generation is completely disjoint from the Snowflake transaction system. I see. So in your example, the Spark query could have snapshot isolation across multiple routes. Yes. And that's only through Snowflake. It's not natively in Iceberg. Yes, that's not natively in Iceberg, no. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions for Iceberg? So. What what was like one sort of one unexpected thing, one unexpected problem you guys had to deal with that like, like that like you obviously you spec out the problem or think to support it, but then when you actually get into the weeds of iceberg, you park your files or this environment that turned out to be harder than you had, you had originally anticipated. Uh, there were there were many, <laughs> uh, so there were there was uh, some there were some challenges in do, doing data type mappings. Uh, some of the native data types were simpler because they directly mapped, uh, but um, I think uh, Snowflake has a timestamp with time zone, but Iceberg doesn't have an, and doesn't have the data type. So we had to decide how to represent that. Snowflake has a variant data type, which is a schemaless struct, uh, but Iceberg doesn't have that concept. So uh, we are still kind of thinking about how we can manage that in a in an how we can manage that well in in the Iceberg land. Um, in addition to that, the way Iceberg represents metadata, um, you can imagine that every snapshot is uh, is complete in itself. So every snapshot points to a manifest list, and that points to a manifest file, uh, to to a list of manifest files. So a snapshot does not depend on the previous snapshot, but that also means that when an update operation happens, you need to uh, the new snapshot needs to have an entire list of all the data files show up in the new snapshot. So computing that the diff of that list um, in Snowflake is very efficient because, because of the way we laid out a metadata to for the updates to happen much faster. But translating that, that, that didn't directly translate to how Iceberg lays it out. So that became like, how do we make that operation efficient computing the diff of the files and making that list show up again and have it be independent was uh, was interesting. Awesome, thank you. Um, with that, I think uh, the iceberg piece is done. Um, I would like to hand over to Tyler who's uh, presenting the next section. Thank you. Um, so let me share my screen one second. Um, let's see. And then, great. Um, so today I'll be talking through Snowpipe streaming. Um, so before we begin, maybe to give some context about the history of data ingestion at Snowflake. 
When, post, uh, when Snowflake first became available, we had a few, uh, a few ingestion mechanisms. Um, our first mechanism was the insert statement. Um, so just manually running insert statements from the driver of your choice. Uh, we introduced support for copy, which allow you to copy a file from some uh, location in cloud storage into a table. Um, we then introduced Snowpipe, which then allowed for a continuous copy command. Essentially, as you put data into a bucket, we would read those files, ingest them into the table behind the scenes, and then you could query them. What we were missing from our ingestion mechanisms was a way to ingest data in a low latency fashion in an ordered fashion uh, that it was high throughput. Our, ingestion, our other ingestion mechanisms, while they did offer some of this, did not offer it comprehensively. So folks would often hack together copy commands to adjust data in order or do it via insert statements and then get throttled, things like that. So we introduced Snowpipe streaming to introduce some of these, um, to, to overcome some of these challenges. So what Snowpipe streaming is, is it's direct, direct, direct data streaming to Snowflake. Um, this is ingestion to tables over HTTPS. Uh, no pipes are involved, uh, no commands are run, um, nothing like that. With Snowpipe streaming, you can achieve exactly once and per channel ordering. Um, I'll elaborate in a, uh, the next slide what a channel is, but essentially we introduced the concept of uh, virtual partitions in the forms of channels that you can stream data to Snowflake into. Um, so you can process this data uh, once, um, you can process it in order, uh, things like that. Um, this is a low latency ingestion mechanism. Data, uh, once presented to a client SDK, which I'll uh, discuss in a future slide, uh, once the data is presented to the client SDK, it's queryable on the order of seconds um, in the common case. Uh, ingestion right now, um, the, our latency with Snowpipe streaming is on the order of two to five seconds. And the, um, the five seconds tends to come from cloud storage tail latencies. This is a high throughput ingestion mechanism. It's possible to stream gigabytes per second ingestion uh, into a single table. It's low, over, low overhead. Um, it's minimal configuration and setup is needed, um, like all of Snowflake's features. And this is also a low cost option for both flood and trickle cases. Um, it's possible to aggregate data um, to make trickle cases cheap. Um, and it's also possible to flood, um, to provide a flood and have that be um, fairly cheap too and just as well. So the new concepts that we introduced as part of Snowpipe streaming. Uh, so I elaborated, or I mentioned the channel in the previous slide. So a channel is basically a logical partition that represents a connection from a client into a destination chain table. Channels are names. So you can open up the channel to a table, you can give it a name, and you can stream data um, over that channel. Um, channels are owned by a single client. Um, two clients cannot share the same channel. If a channel is opened by one client and then reopened up by another, the first client's rights are invalidated. Uh, it can no longer write data to that table via that channel. Um, these are roughly analogous to say um, Kafka partitions. However, um, you can have as many of these as you want. These are named and these have the concept of an offset token. So as you write data into a channel, you can provide an offset token that allows you to reason about um, your data source on your side. So for instance, like if you're reading data from a Kafka partition or something like that, you could actually provide as a string to Snowflake the offset number um, within the Kafka partition. Uh, the offset tokens are totally opaque to Snowflake. Um, we provide them to you uh, with the channel. You can get the latest committed offset token and reason about ingestion rates on your side. Um, we offer a client SDK as part of this. Uh, so this is Snowflake's applied software, uh, which we bundled for convenience on an existing ingest SDK that accepts bytes in the form of rows. It then buffers that, that data for some period of time. It then aggregates this data across channels that a particular client has opened and flushes them to cloud storage. Once it's flushed, it then registers them to Snowflake tables via REST API. And we'll go through diagrams in the upcoming slides that cover what the flow of data actually looks like. Um, this is only available in Java for now. Um, and it does a fair bit on its side to do the buffering, the flushing, and things like that. Uh, we've also introduced the concept of a mixed table. So a mixed table is, it's a regular Snowflake table However, unlike regular Snowflake tables that are only made up of FDN files, which is Snowflake's um, proprietary data format, it contains a mix of BDEC files, which is the new file type um, created by the client SDK, and FDN files. So when you query this table, you'll query a, a set of different file formats, um, which is why we call it a mixed table. 
We do background migration from BDEC to FDN via regular DML, um, copy Snowflake, things like that, in which scan back occurs from FDN or from BDEX to FDNs. Um, and we also have reclustering in small file GC that migrates this data transparently in the background. Um, it's important to note that the data is queryable immediately when it's in BDEC format. We just migrate it in the background for convenience. So um, maybe, you're, maybe she's just going to get into this. This basically smells, so smells like Unistore, right? Like that you have this, like, I'm assuming BDEC is like a row format, and then you eventually migrate it to the, co the columnar format. Is that correct? Uh, BDEC is actually a columnar format. Um, BDEC okay. is, is actually, it's, it's basically Arrow. Um, however, these okay. files can span data across multiple tables, which is why we don't just call them like arrow blobs or something like that. It, it's kind of a, 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 a blob that can belong to multiple tables. And to be clear, so this BDEC thing is also internal. It's not like the user needs to know. Exactly, exactly. What, this what, is what totally, yep. yep. And this is totally transparent to the user. So if they're querying at the end or BDEC or if there's migration occurs, they don't need to be concerned about that at all. It just works. Right, so um, Gavin, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, you said that it's basically arrow, but that it's not because it, it has to span kind of these multiple partitions. I'm just kind of curious what the the, tech, the particular technical limitation um, is. You don't have to go super deep, but... Yeah, I, I maybe I should have rephrased that differently. So the data itself is in arrow um, columnar format. However, the blob has what we call chunks within it. And a chunk can belong to a particular table. So you could have, say, chunk one, that's of arrow data that belongs to table one. You could have chunk two that belongs to table two, so on and so forth. So it's not just you know straight arrow that makes up the file, it's it's segments of arrow data. Got it. So like record batches, but much larger. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Um, so here's a, a diagram of the client channel table mapping. So in this example here, we have client one that has opened up a few channels to different tables. So as it writes data to these tables, the data gets buffered amongst these channels. We generate the blob that belongs to multiple tables, and then we go and register it to these tables. And when you query this data, we have offsets associated with the, the per table data that allow us to know, okay, start reading from this particular range in the file. Um, and over here, client two, uh, this only has two channels that belong to table three. So if client two were to say open up channel um, 11 to table one, client one's writes over that channel would be invalidated. It would not be able to continue writing to table one. It would have to reopen up the channel or create a new channel to write to that table. Uh, this is some highlights of the Java ingest SDK that we provide. So we have these client APIs um, where you can use a factory instance to open up channels to a particular table. So you can provide the name, uh, the target database schema, things like that. Um, there's some authentication related information that needs to be provided so that you can actually write to this table. Um, we support key pair authentication as well as OAuth. Um, and then once you open up a channel, you have a channel object. And via that channel object, you can call insert row or insert rows where you can provide um, the row in a schematized format. Um, the offset token that allows you to reason about um, your upstream source with respect to that particular row. Um, we also have an SDK, or excuse me, a method that allows you to get the latest committed offset token for a table. Um, since there is some buffering that takes place both client and server side, um, you can call this to know, okay, how far is Snowflake like actually committed with respect to my upstream source? So I could like throw data away or, or do checkpointing or whatever. And then we also have a close option, which just um, performs some memory management. This, this is not really like a Snowflake option. You don't really need to actually call this. So in terms of what the flow of data actually looks like. So first we start with the client SDK running in the customer's environment. So the, the user opens up one or more channels to a particular table and then provides rows in the schematized format for these tables. As I mentioned before, we buffer this data in chunks um, client side, and then we generate blobs that um, are then persisted to cloud storage. It's important to note that these chunks um, are encrypted with per table level keys. Um, so we are not writing you know, plain data to cloud storage. This is all encrypted uh, with keys derived from the base tables keys. So things like tri secret and stuff like that continue to work. Um, security is paramount for Snowflake and, and we are very secure with what we do here. Um, but once the data has been written to cloud storage, uh, the client SDK then calls a REST API that tells Snowflake, hey, go and register these blobs to the table so that they're then queryable. 
this request hits um, a normal query um, GS node. Um, so um, I'm not sure which talks have been given here about Snowflake, but uh, we have clusters that customers are mapped to internally on Snowflake side. And this request will hit a cluster that a customer is mapped to. Once we have received that request, we do a number of things, including authorization, authentication, um, privilege text, things like that. But then we fan out to a separate type of cluster that we call a commit service uh, cluster. And what this commit service um, is responsible for doing is buffering this data, um, queuing it, um, doing some exactly once, and messaging checks, things like that. Um, so it'll get this, this, this request from the front end node and it will respond with, hey, we got this yet, but it's not yet committed. And this gets propagated back to the client SDK, which is told essentially, we got the data, however, it's not committed, you can continue sending us more data. It's an asynchronous protocol. So then the commit service, once it has these, um, these chunks, what it's doing is that it queues this, this, these blob registration requests up. Um, we do some deduplication, we do some validation, um, we have a number of sequencers that the client SDK passes along that we use to ensure that, hey, can the client actually write to this table? Have we received all the messages that we expect? Things like that. Um, and once it has buffered in, um, a set of, of blob registration requests for some period of time, it then goes and actually creates a new table version by fast committing um, via our normal table commit operations. At that point, once the data has been committed, it is then queryable um, in the BDEC format. Um, as I mentioned before, in the background, of course, like since this data is written in narrow format, um, if you have DML, copy Snowflake operations, things like that, reclustering, we then migrate from um, the BDEC format to FDN format. Um, this is totally transparent to the user. The data is queryable as before. And once you query it, we scan both the arrow and the FDN data. And elaborating a bit more on what the querying uh, portion looks like. So say you, you query one of your mixed tables. Um, after we do our normal compiler magic, um, oh, I think we have a question. Steve, go for it. Can you, you want to mute yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm just curious, what kind of message can you ingest into Snowflake? Like uh, users can only insert or they can do updates and deletes. And if uh, users want to do delete and updates, do they need to specify something like a primary key? That's a great question. Um, for now, this is an insert only um, API. Um, if you want to do update or insert or like some type of CDC, um, you have a couple ways of doing that, right? Like you can embed an action, say, in, in your row and then reconcile that, you know, on the Snowflake side. Um, we are working on something called merge tables, which will allow you to do this kind of like continuous um, insert, update, delete based on merge um, with a primary key supplied, but that's a little bit out for now. Yeah, thanks. Yep. And is there another one? Oh, great question. All right. Um, okay, so um, really quickly, querying a mixed table. So um, so once we, we do our normal compiler magic, we get to the table version and metadata resolution. So we have a metadata layer that tracks um, for every table version that gets created, what files were added and removed from the table. So in this example, let's say we have um, T1, um, and this is a delta that says we added um, partition two, um, and P here is, is I'm abbreviating as FDN. So say we added FDN partition um, two, and we deleted FDN partition one. At table version two, we added BDEC one and BDEC two, and in table version three, we added BDEC three and BDEC four. And now um, with this data, um, which by the way, um, I forgot to mention all of the BDECs that we, um, that Snowflake um, has registered to it also have EP information per generated and passed along by the client SDK. So we can do things like pruning and all our normal um, optimizations and stuff like that. Um, we take these files, we, we do pruning, we, we have a set of rewrite rules that operate on these. We then generate the plan, and then once the plan actually execute, it scans the mix of the Snowflake partition P2 and then the BDEX um, one through four. Uh, that's all part of the same scan set. There's no special operations or operators or unions or anything that takes place. We have a single table scan operator that's capable of scanning both um, our internal format and this new format. And once we scan this data, we generate row sets and we pass them down to our other operators. Uh, but that's it. 
Uh, that's all I had to present. So like <clears throat> the, I mean, a lot of the infrastructure to sort of keep track of these different like table versions and like that, like uh, that all is in Snowflake. It's obviously the, the error yep. stuff and making sure that like, okay, I have a bunch of extra, extra locations I need to scan. So then there's obviously, obviously the, the, the API that takes up on the inbound, the front end. But it sounds like a lot of this is actually reusing existing Snowflake infrastructure, which makes things it, fantastic, right? Like, it, yep, yep. We, yeah. we tried to plug into as much as we could with everything here, right? So, like you said, we, we plugged into our existing metadata layer. We plugged into a lot of our existing, you know, scanning infrastructure, things like that. We had to do a ton of work to plumb these these files through, though. Um, that that okay. was a, a big part of the difficulty here, as well as having files that belong to multiple tables. This was something that was new for Snowflake. Um, so this made things like garbage collection, um, EP management, encryption, things like that, um, very difficult to, to pull off correctly. So a lot of work plumbing that through. Okay. Ryan, did you have a question? Sorry, I think I unmuted by accident. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, cool, thank you. Yep, uh, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Ashish. Ashish, you're actually on track here, this is amazing. And I will unmute myself. <clears throat> right, so I'm the last and definitely the least uh, of the presenters. Uh, my reputation at Snowflake is nowhere as close to as Andy describes it. Uh, but thank you, Andy. Um, so what we've told you about today about Snowflake is how we're sort of expanding data warehousing, how we're improving data lake, how we're working with the open source, getting back to the open source and even bringing things from the open source, enhancing them with features and facilities that Snowflake has built in. Um, there's one more thing that you know we want to talk about, which is Unistore today. So if you take Tyler's presentation, it talks about how can you ingest a lot, a lot more data into Snowflake tables, gigabytes per second. Um, if you look at Nalima's presentation, it talks about how can you query data that's already produced um, using Snowflake uh, or other open source tools that are out there. However, there's this one little piece that's sort of missing is how can you do low latency querying um, and low latency transactions on top of Snowflake? And so that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, and that product is called Unistore for us. Um, that's the marketing name for it, a uh, better name for it in the sort of industry is probably HTAP. Uh, it's very typical. You see two different sets of databases. You see transaction processing databases. You see analytic databases. Customers are constantly performing ETLs, ELTs between these two systems, replicating data, making multiple copies, um, making sure that they have to monitor this. Uh, not getting consistent data across these two different sets of systems. Um, and this basically hurts innovation for them. So we want to see if we can bring all of this into one system together, one database, one connection, one product. As Tyler said, you know, one compiler, one set of operators, one set of SQL API, make it really easy for customers. That's consistently been our goal at Snowflake, and we keep striving in that direction. So we call that bureaucracy, um, and we want to get away with that. So that's what a single transactional and analytical system put together looks like. Uh, we call it Unistore. Uh, so before I sort of step into, I'll go back one slide. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, Unistore. I have a few questions. Let's make this a little interactive. We have some time. Um, so, you know, Snowflake started off as a data warehousing service. Um, anybody, what do you think is the current percentage of DMLs versus select statements that Snowflake sees in a day? Probably 50. Are you, are you including inserts? DMLs, yeah. Any inserts, updates, deletes, merges are all DMLs. All right, so I, I got five to I got five percent in in chat. I got two percent in chat. Um, anybody else? I, I'll say fifty fifty. Yeah. 
So we see about 60% um, are DMLs, sometimes a little more, um, and there are fewer actually select statements. Um, next question, what is the P95 uh, query execution time for a select statement or a DML in Snowflake? These are analytic queries, Gavin. <laughs> I wish it was 200. Five minutes, 200 milliseconds, 10 seconds. So, so five seconds is our P95 uh, for you know, any statement, whether it's a DML or whether it's a select statement, right? What is our P99? I'll, 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 I won't wait for this one. It's less than a minute for all of these. And our P50s, as someone said, is, is closer to you know, the hundreds of millisecond range. Right? So what this kind of tells you is that customers are already using data warehousing products as operational data warehousing products. The world of HDAP is more real than it ever existed before. Right? And so whether you, know, you want it or not, Snowflake is running an HDAP system today. And if we can improve the concurrency uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude, and if we can lower the latency by you know one and a half orders of magnitude or so, then we can have a really compelling HTAP product for our customers. So that's what we've set out to do. And we've done that by introducing another table type, which is called as hybrid tables. Um, so what hybrid tables do, um, again, with the same connection, you can create a new table type and it will perform both operational as well as analytical queries well. It will support critical transactional features like you know, unique keys, primary keys, indexes, referential uh, integrity constraints. It also does role level locking. These we don't support with standard tables in Snowflake today out of the box. Like we, you can define a constraint, but we won't enforce it. You, we, we don't really have support for indexes. Um, but what we also did is we said that now we've got a new table type, hybrid tables, but and you've also got standard tables, but you need to be able to do transactions across these two seamlessly. Um, so we worked on that. Um, now you can sort of imagine to build something like hybrid tables, you need a different storage system. Here's, you know, the way we have columnar storage is not going to work if you have operational uh, data that needs to be stored. And so you actually have two different kinds of storage systems between hybrid tables as well as standard snowflake tables. So you actually have to do transactions across them. So fair amount of challenges that are part of this. Um, but that's the beauty is we do all the hard work and the plumbing behind the scenes. You know, new compiler operators, we've done them. New execution operators for the new storage engine, we've added that. But it's all seamless to you as a customer, right? So we'll take a quick look at what Snowflake's architecture looks like today. Um, and we, we've shared this, it, it's, 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 it's a few different layers. We call these cloud services. Some of the people, uh, you know, Tyler call it GS, but that's what it means is cloud services. That's where the client's queries come in. Um, infrastructure manager, make sure cloud resources are managed. There's the compiler slash optimizer, which actually compiles your query. Query comes in and gets authenticated, authorized. Um, metadata gets looked up. You know, what is the catalog? Is it still there? All of that is in FTP. Um, eventually, this query after compilation gets scheduled on query process, you know, virtual warehouses or compute, uh, which customers provision. You know, a DAG is executed on, which is our query plan. The result is produced by scanning data from columnar storage, lob storage. Um, the re result is returned back to the client going back up the, the chain, right? Now, we, as I mentioned, columnar storage is not the best for operational data, but, you know, row-based storage is. So we added a new row-based storage engine, which works underneath the same infrastructure, the same layers, the same stack, right? The query processing, um, as I mentioned, has new operators that can scan row-based storage, right? Um, the metadata manager also has to do more work. So it needs to understand how row-based locking can be done. And some of that has to be pushed down through the query processing layers 
previously in Snowflake, the, the query processing is mostly oblivious to transactions and metadata manager. So query processing is mostly stateless, and we've changed that to support row level transactions down um, at this level. So, but we didn't stop there. What, what we're doing to get good analytical performance as well is we take the row based storage and then we turn it into columnar storage. Right? And, you know, we, we, we're not talking a whole lot about this. And this is one of the reasons why when Andy came and said, Ashish, will you talk about Unistore? I said, I, I can't talk enough about the internals of it yet. We're sort of, you know, partway through rolling this out, figuring this out. So, not enough details can be shared. I'm sorry about that. Um, sometime soon. Uh, but we turn this into columnar storage such that, you know, uh, you can perform good analytical querying on top of this as well. So, you know, I didn't want to sort of end that quickly, but we're tracking on time and we wanted to keep about five to 10 minutes left for more questions. And, you know, whoever has more questions, please shout, you know, shoot at any of us. I, I saw something go, go by. I see, you kept your promise. Thank you for, for finishing on time. I'll applaud behalf of everyone else. Okay, as she said, we have time for questions, although, again, he will be somewhat uh, cagey about his answers about Unistore, but that's okay. We, we can keep pushing him. Ben, I, I saw your hand first. Why don't you go for it? Uh, Unistore apparently adds indexes to Snowflake. How does that work? Um, I, I know that Snowflake for columnar data, you write an entire block to S3. How do you have a mutable index based on S3? It's a, it's a great question, Ben. So with Unistore, we store the data, all writes go to the row-based store first. And in the row-based store, you know, tables are part of a key space. Indexes are part of a separate key space. Um, and so, just like you know, other databases like MySQL or so, uh, we have an index which you can use for lookup. Uh, Gavin, go for it. Um, yeah, hi. First, thanks for the presentation. That was super cool. Um, so I have a question. I work in the GraphQL space, and with GraphQL APIs, you often do a field-wise selection, right? Because you're going to pick a row set, and you're going to traverse relationships, and it's always a sparse set of columns. I'm curious if you're implementing a like a columnar storage layer for these OLTB uh, storage. Have you benchmarked what the performance difference is between row-wise and columnar? Um we we have done some benchmarking. We're not quite at the level to sort of look at GraphQL like queries and see how sparse column, uh, you know, sparse. If you've got lots and lots of columns, then what actually happens when you select a few? Got it. Okay. Yeah. No worries. All right, Stephen. Uh, you want to meet yourself? Hi. So. How would the hybrid unit store really compare to the FDB that Snowflake uses? Kind of amazing to me that if Snowflake engineering team is planning to maintain parallel development on FDB, the Snowflake columnar existing database format, and also these new units. Uh, great question. So, um, you know, foundation DB FDB is, is like key part of our metadata infrastructure. We make huge contributions there to open source as well. Um, the way I see it is these things are sort of, you know, we're a database company, we can invest in multiple different database technologies simultaneously. And it, it sort of helps us uh, make sure that our own cloud services run better. That's the best. Actually, maybe another way to ask Steven's question is, can you confirm or deny that Unistore runs on foundation UV? I cannot. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Um, so I guess my question would be, what was, um, like how much did you have to change in the optimizer, or like would you guys call it a compiler, to know that it's a row store showing up? And I guess the other question would be, what is the strategy for going forward for Snowflake, would you, would you go to the customers and say, hey, I see you're doing a bunch of updates on, on this table. And then would, would you then recommend, uh, and then can you automatically migrate them to, to a hybrid table? 
or would like, I guess how aggressive would be get people off of using the way, you know, doing, doing oak to be stuff on existing stuff like now and how like and to get them over the hybrid stuff. Well, so the, the answer to your second question is very easy. If there's a customer who comes and says, look, I want to do operational updates, you know, inserts, deletes on a regular Snowflake table, table, you can probably do tens per second today, maybe hundreds if you sort of figure it out, if you, you'd have to partition, et cetera. We built this as a data warehousing system, right? But in the unit store world, we want to take that to, you know, a few orders of magnitude higher, thousands, tens of thousands, et cetera, right? And so you would instantly know from your use case saying, this is not going to work with standard tables and this will work for only work with, and, and we've talked to customers and they see this, they know this. Uh, how many changes, what, what are the kind of changes and how many changes do we have to make to the optimizer? There are a lot of tricky and interesting problems here because we don't want customers to have to think about their workload, especially when it comes to scheduling on the compute side. So you could probably have mixed workloads that need to run on the same query processing uh, infrastructure, the same virtual warehouse. So how do you decide what is a short query, what is a long query, or what is a, a, a analytic query and what is an operational query? Um, we put some smarts in the compiler, um, optimizer, um, to sort of figure that out. Um, you know, again, we'll start simple and then we'll add more complexity as we go. Um, you know, we don't use machine learning today for this kind of stuff, but maybe we will eventually as well. I think, I think the, the redshift people talk about that, and I think that's public too, that they, they use something like that to figure out whether you're shorter, 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 long way. Okay. That's right. Um, all right, very exciting. All right, anybody else? Hi, uh, Ryan from Datadog. How does the uh, Unisor storage engine change the way customers pay for Snowflake? Um, because it seems fairly different than the pricing model that you're supporting today. Um, and obviously the cost structure could be vastly different as well when you're not writing to S3. Yeah, that's um, a very good question, Ryan. Good to see you again, by the way. Um, uh, we're not talking about the pricing in a whole lot of detail. We've talked to a few different customers about it yet, but it's still very much internal in the works. Of course, there will be, so you know, today we, you know, customers pay for compute um, in Snowflake and they pay for storage, which is on S3. Those are the, the two key dimensions that they pay for. Um, if you look at other sort of vendors who, cloud vendors who do operational workloads, then they've got additional dimensions to what Snowflake has for data warehousing, right? So if you look at, you know, AWS operational databases, then they charge for IO, um, and so we will add similar dimensions to uh, for hybrid tables. Thanks. Congrats on the release. Thank you. Oh, okay, awesome. Sheesh. Uh, Lumina yeah. and Tyler, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. This is this is you guys pulled it off. You finished ahead of schedule in three talks. So congrats. This is a new record for us. Yeah.